We have an increased risk of Molina spasm and Borco spasm. If we do a TIVA, it's going to be the lowest risk. If you do a balance, it's the next. And then if you do uh, a, a uh, inhalation technique, uh, then it's even far less uh, of a, oh no, what am I, boy, I guess I, I should have took a, taken a nap at lunch. All right, so open airway techniques with TIVA is going to have the lowest risk of causing airway stimulation because we're not going to do any kind of laryngoscopy. If I put an LMA in, then that's going to have far less of a risk of stimulating the airway than if I do in, uh, a endotracheal intubation. But the problem with an LMA is, number one, it's not a secured airway, so if you did have to do increased airway pressures for a bronchospasm, uh, the seal probably would be broken. Uh, and the LMA, unless you're using a flexible LMA, is going to limit your access to the surgical site. Well, what about intubation? Well, if you're going to intubate one of these asthmatic patients, you definitely need to make sure that they're intubated deep. So besides using an appropriate induction dose of propofol, you should also use uh, some fentanyl, uh, or you're going to give uh, remifentanyl uh, as a bolus as well. Uh, to end up deepening those uh, reflexes so that you don't get stimulation. In addition to that, if you give IV lidocaine, that will also depress airway responses. But then you have to look at, well, I'm going to use local anesthesia to do my procedure anyway, so how much local am I going to need to do the intraoral procedure versus how much local am I injecting uh, into that IV line? Another way to try to depress the uh, reflexes is to use a, a lidocaine nebulizer. But the problem with that is the lidocaine tends to irritate the uh, vocal cords uh, before it anesthetizes them. But for whatever reason, if you give albuterol mixed with the lidocaine, it, it doesn't uh, tend to do that as much. For agents, we want to definitely avoid histamine, all right? So if you are still using uh, meperidine, you don't want to use that uh, on an asthmatic. Uh, the chance of meperidine really precipitating in an asthma attack is going to be extremely low. It would be at higher risk if the patient was already wheezing, but then again, if the patient was already wheezing, why were we doing an anesthetic on them anyway? For your neuromuscular blocking agents, certainly succinylcholine, while there will be some histamine released with that, it has been shown to be safe with asthmatics uh, as well as rocuronium. And then our TIVA agents for propofol, we definitely know that that is going to blunt uh, the bronchospasm uh, as well as cause bronchodilatation. So it has a dual effect for asthmatic patients. Ketamine is a sympathomimetic bronchodilator. It is not as effective as albuterol, but it certainly is going to increase uh, bronchodilatation uh, with our patients as well. But there's nothing better than the volatile gases. I mean, the volatile gases definitely have a direct effect on the smooth muscle. Uh, it depresses airway reflexes, and it will attenuate the bronchospastic activity. Sevoforane is probably the drug that has the most pronounced effect. Isoforane is good as well. You don't want to use desforane because desforane is a bronco irritant. So that agent would not be used uh, in these individuals. And for a uh, dental practice, <coughs> if you're going to have a, a nebulizer, probably the biggest bang for your dollar is going to be sevoforane. Uh, but the cheapest to run is going to be isoforane. We want to limit the amount of peak inspiratory pressures when we're bagging these patients. For the, for the expiratory phase, we need to increase that as well because asthmatics have a prolonged exhalation, so you want to do a ratio on event of about one to three. You want to decrease your minute volume because you do not want to end up causing barotrauma due to an increased amount of gas. So you, your tidal volume is going to be set at about six mLs per kilo. And respiratory rate, 10 or whatever is able to maintain normocapnia. PEEP. PEEP has, it's a dual-edged sword. So PEEP can be helpful in the fact that it's going to keep airways splinted open, but PEEP can also make it more difficult for them to exhale. So when you do use PEEP on these individuals, you should keep it very low. The PEEP should be at no more than 6 to 8 centimeters of water. 
If you're going to use rock uranium to intubate someone and you're going to use neostigmine reversal, it's best to add either glycopyrrolate or atropine to it so it's going to decrease the secretions from the neostigmine so you're going to have less chance of precipitating a laryngospasm. Sigamidex is not going to have those same effects, so if you use Sigamidex, you don't have to use an anticholinergic. Well, what do we do if we have intraoperative bronchospasm? Well, signs of intraoperative bronchospasm would be if you're squeezing the bag, you see that the inspiratory pressures are rising. Also, if you're looking at the patient and you're feeling the bag, you're going to have a prolonged exhalation phase, and you may also see some abnormalities with the chest wall rise. Uh, in the fall. And the, probably the greatest uh, risk for developing intraoperative bronchospasm is that the patient is too light. So they're getting irritation uh, from the fact that they're not deep enough. If you look at the capnograph wave and you see that slow rise uh, causing the upturn in phase three, that's pretty much indicative of some type of uh, prolonged exhalation and that is basically what someone uses a uh, pathognomonic sign uh, for bronchospasm. So how are we going to manage this? Well, the first thing you want to do is increase your oxygen content if you're using TEVA. So you're going to make sure you're giving them 100% oxygen, turn them off of the ventilator and switch to a bag so that you can feel how much pressure it takes to actually uh, ventilate that individual. And then listen to the chest for wheezing. You want to deepen the anesthetic in case it was a cause of light anesthesia, so increase the dose of propofol. You can add ketamine to it as well. If you're using an inhalation technique, that's the only time that you don't use 100% oxygen. You're going to increase the concentration of your inhalation agent because that's going to give you more bronchodilatation than the IV drugs. The other thing to think about is definitely suction the endotracheal tube because if you're using a small endotracheal tube, it's very easy to have mucus plug up the opening for that tube, and that's gonna give you a uh, difficult airway exchange also. And then after you do those steps, you wanna have, have a short-acting beta agent. You can either spray it directly down the endotracheal tube if it has an adapter on it. So typically about eight to 10 puffs. You're gonna see the albuterol kind of form droplets on the tube. But after you puff it, you need to be squeezing that bag at the same time so that you're forcing the albuterol mist down into the lung. Having the droplets form there and then trying to get it in there, it's going to decrease the effectiveness. And there's very little albuterol that gets into the lung by spraying down the endotracheal tube. In fact, you're far better off if you use some kind of inline circuit adapter. So now I have gas going through the line and I'm squeezing in the, in the circuit itself and the gas is carrying that albuterol mist down into the lung. You can also hook up an inline nebulizer to an anesthesia circuit and deliver that as well. So the most effective way is definitely to either use an inline nebulizer or an inline circuit to deliver your albuterol. And how much you give and how often you give it really is dependent upon the patient's response. Typically for bronchospasm, it's albuterol, albuterol, albuterol. If you start to see some type of uh, attacking dysrhythmia, then obviously you want to back off on the amount of albuterol that you're using. And then this is a picture of the different circuits that you can have. So you can hook up an inline nebulizer to your anesthesia circuit. You can put your MVI uh, dose canister into a little nipple, uh, and then this is the circuit itself where you're going to inject down into the nipple with your MDI puffer. Now, who can tell me whether that's a Ventolin or a Pro Air inhaler? There's only two types of albuterol inhalers you're going to get Pro Air or Ventolin. Which one's this? Okay, this Vin is Ventolin. Vin and the reason I know that is because it has a plastic calendar attached right to the MDI. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because you have to have the right circuit for this to fit into. So if you look at that circuit, and then you look at this one, this is a pro air. How do I know that? There's no counter on there. That little nipple fits right into this circuit. So when your staff buys you Albuterol, you need to know what type of adapter you're going to use. All right, because you can't use this 
in a Venolin nebulizer circuit, you can't use Venolin in this circuit. It's not going to fit. And then if you want to use this 60cc syringe technique, it'll work if you have pro air because the little nipple's going to fit in there. But if you put the Venolin inhaler in there, there's your counter. You can squeeze on that as much as you want. There's no albuterol that's going to come out of there. So this is what a Venolin nebulizer uh, circuit looks like. So this is going to fit inside there, and now you're going to be able to squeeze it and then put the albuterol into the circuit. Now I told this to, uh, there's a sedation resource. They sell these. And I said, you know, do you know what you're selling? Well, yeah, you just buy this one. No, you have to know which Venolin that you're buying and then your staff is going to need to make sure that they have the right <coughs> circuit for that to fit into. If you have severe bronchospasm, if a patient comes in and they say they have a, an Atrovent inhaler, then you can switch off. You can use your Venolin inhaler, you can use your Atrovent inhaler uh, to try to break the bronchospasm. Terbutaline is an injectable beta-2 agent, but there's no advantage to using this over albuterol unless you can't get albuterol into the patient for some reason. And then if you're truly refractory, all right, the patient is just going down the tubes, then forget about the albuterol, you're going to use epinephrine. And it's always preferable to use it intramuscularly. Well, I have an IV started, why am I giving it in the thigh? Well, the reason for that is that IV epinephrine is a rather dramatic uh, sympathomimetic response, okay? And if you give too much of IV epinephrine, you're going to see wide swings in blood pressure and heart rate. Most anesthesiologists are not going to give it any muscle. In an acute asthma attack that isn't responsive to albuterol, we're going to give it IV, and you're going to start off very low, five to ten mites only. And even there, you're going to see significant increases in blood pressure and in heart rate. And then if you already have an IV started until you can get this patient transferred, if they're not responsive, then uh, you can also add steroids so that they'll have a, more of a time to work. And in cases of refractory bronchospasm, you may need uh, magnesium. This is why I'm saying you do not put people to sleep in your office if they're wheezing. Because you see that there's a bunch of different drugs that you may have to give intraoperatively uh, in order to correct this. Magnesium will work. You give two grams over 20 minutes. It is a smooth muscle dilator, but the patient can report some weakness with it. But if you gave a lot of epinephrine and you had a tachydysrhythmia, the magnesium may help with the tachydysrhythmia as well. And this is what happens when patients need to get, they have such severe bronchospasm that once they get into the hospital and they're put on a ventilator with uh, inhalation agents, they may also have to add heliox because the heliox is able to diffuse through the very small airway openings and carry the drug uh, to the site. Methyl xanthines, there's no reason in the world why anybody should stock IBM and awful in their office. The risk of seizures and tachydysrhythmia are significant with that drug. So this is not a drug that you'd want to use. So what are we going to do if we have a bronchospasm with an open airway? Well, if you have an anesthetized patient in an open airway, you can't just take that puffer and start puffing in, the, uh, in front of the patient. The drug isn't getting to the airway. If you have an LMA and you try to squirt down the LMA, what can definitely happen is the, the albuterol can irritate the cords, and now you get a laryngospasm as well as a bronchospasm. And this is what I call the albuterol death cloud. So somebody has an open airway technique, they have somebody with bronchospasm, and they're puffing their albuterol uh, to try to get it into the patient, and what happens? Well, you get some drug, your assistant gets some drug, maybe the patient gets some drug, but the patient's getting the drug on their skin, and the lungs aren't getting very much of anything. So how are you going to treat this? Well, this is a measure that everybody talks about. You get a face mask, you have this little adapter, and then you put your albuterol into a 60cc syringe, and now you're going to squeeze that and squeeze the bag and get the albuterol in. But what happens when you put a face mask on a patient and try to ventilate it? Is the mouth open or closed? Closed. 
Well, it's closed, isn't it? If I if I'm gonna put you, I induce you and I put you to sleep, I pull your chin up, put the mask on, your lips are closed. I'm breathing. The air, the oxygen is going into you through the mouth, through the nose. So if I do that and I use this puffer, all the albuterol is doing is going on the skin. Some of it's going into the nose. If it's in the nose, it's totally ineffective. It isn't the albuterol gets absorbed. You have to get albuterol as a topical treatment on the lung tissue, not systemically. So what you're gonna to need to do is definitely put a bite block in that person's mouth. And you have to use a large face mask. And now you and your assistant really have to time everything because somebody has to simultaneously squeeze and squeeze the bag in, in order to get the albuterol down into the lungs. And that's kind of tough to do. So there's a solution for this, and it's called a KAB absorber. And what this is, is a little container that has uh, soda lime in it. You can connect it with this connector to an IV pole. And I can intubate somebody or put an LMA in them and have them spontaneously breathe. And I can connect an anesthesia circuit to that and do uh, a uh, circle system case Almost nobody does this technique where they hook it up to a vaporizer, but it could be done. So this is what it looks like in my operatory. I have this thing standing here right by my oxygen outlet. And if I need to, what I can do is I can turn this completely shut. I'm gonna have an anesthesia line where I can give total positive pressure if I have a laryngospasm, or I crank it open a little bit and I can ventilate the patient if I need to. So I use that Plus, I also get an inline nebulizer. With an inline nebulizer, I connect this to an E-tank cylinder of oxygen. I then put this in uh, on the mask, put a bite block into that patient, and now every time that the patient breathes, if they're spontaneously breathing, they're going to have albuterol delivered with the oxygen that I'm giving them. If they're not breathing, when I squeeze the, mat, squeeze the anesthesia bag, I'm going to deliver the albuterol to the lungs. So I don't have to worry about puff, puff, squeeze, squeeze. It's all a very systematic technique that's very easy to accomplish. And this is just sometimes, it depends on what size uh, handheld nebulizer you need as to whether you have to have some different connectors to hook this up to the bag. So in summary, you have a well-controlled asthmatics, bronchospasm is unlikely, no office anesthesia, the patient's wheezing, always see your patients a couple of weeks before their surgery to see if they're optimized for their procedure, and intermittent and mild asthmatics are the best candidates for office anesthesia. Some moderates can be done, but never ever do a severe asthmatic in your office for an anesthetic. And with that, uh, does anyone have any questions? Huh? What is that? What is what? Uh, so, yeah, it's, what, do you, what do you mean, what is that? Oh, oh, I'm getting weak here. Okay. <laughs>